Supreet is an assistant vice president in data strategy and products, a data science mentor at Columbia University and Rutgers University, also an advisory board member at Ithaca College. She's also the founder of Data Buzz. Supreet will present the workshop, Introduction to Explainable AI. Please welcome Supreet. I, I do like to do a brief introduction of myself, but most of the points um, that were already covered that yes, currently I'm in Morgan Stanley, but prior to Morgan Stanley, um, I was in ZS as a data science consultant. I was in a regulated industry and then I moved to a highly regulated industry. So you will appreciate my passion for responsible AI and explainable AI. Um, and that is why I'm here to present this topic. I did my education from Rutgers where I got a dual degree, MBA plus MS in data science. Uh, I'm also the founder of Data Buzz. Uh, I would appreciate if you can check out. It's a completely volunteer driven community and we help people who want to pivot in this field. Um, I share some good content there because I'm also an ardent writer and speaker and I share my blogs and my thoughts on what's been happening. Uh, in AI. And as already said, I'm the advisory board member for uh, different organizations. Outside my work and my professional life, I am a fitness enthusiast um, and I'm also the part of the 5 a.m. club. I have written blogs on that as well, so you can check out my Medium page post this session. Now, talking about the topic, so the agenda for today would look something like this. I would like to provide a brief introduction to explainable AI, or just so that everyone is on the same page. Then I'll dive deep into the benefits of explainable AI, and I'll switch my gears to some of the practical techniques that you can use to implement XAI, uh, followed by principles um, of XAI, then we'll touch upon the use cases and how the industry is appreciating it and adopting um, explainable AI. And then um, limitations. And if you want to pivot your career into this, what is the skill set that you need to succeed here? Um, this is going to be a highly interactive session. And I really appreciate uh, if each one of you, once you have digested the content that I shared, I would like to hear everyone's viewpoint, comments, questions. So I highly, highly encourage you to use all the Q&A option, put your comments, questions. And um, if, you have, if you still have something that's unanswered, uh, after all the question answers and this presentation, you can send me a message on LinkedIn as well and follow me for more such content. Um, so let's dive deep into the topic. So what is XAI? Now, since you know my background, I had a career where I was building AI solutions to pitching AI solutions to senior leadership. In a world where AI is still considered a black box, it can be daunting to explain the senior leadership to take the AI route or convince them to appreciate its beauty. And explainable AI provides a gateway of opportunities to solve this problem. As the name suggests, XAI is a framework that can be integrated with your existing machine learning model to understand the output of an AI or machine learning algorithm. And this is not only used to explain the results behind a machine learning algorithm, but can also be used to get uh, a feedback on the results so that you can retrain your model based on the feedback that you receive. And feedback can be in terms of suggestions from business stakeholders, uh, or maybe you detected bias in your model. And then accordingly, you can tweak your hyperparameters, retrain your model before you actually deploy it to production and socialize it to larger audience. And also just a disclaimer um, that I should have done before this slide. All of these views are mine and they have nothing to do with Morgan Stanley or any of the organizations. <laughs> so getting back. Um, now, this is a great visual that I found online, which I feel captures the sentiment of a user or a consumer accurately, right? Um, explainable AI is a rule-based approach, 
right, of early AI. And in contrast with the concept of black box in machine learning, you are basically taking a glass box approach uh, for solving real world problems. And um, it basically, obviously, every, it keeps everyone in the loop. Um, it's all about transparency um, and also helps in the decision making process. So um, there are numerous uh, surveys that have been done which state that a user is more uh, will be more appreciative of your brand and will opt your brand if they trust in you. So once they know that you have deployed these practices, that you are following an explainable AI route and you are investing in those frameworks, uh, the user will actually opt for your brand, right? And uh, these days people are becoming so aware and so socially conscious. Um, so when um, senior leaders or people have this concern that, oh my God, it's going to take so much time to deploy this. Yes, it might take some time, but you have to consider this as an investment because at the end of the day, you're getting a happy user who understands uh, the decision-making process. And if they don't agree with something, they can ask you and you're able to answer them because you had a feedback loop deployed. Um, and, you know, you're not black. Um, so definitely that's one of the biggest benefits of explainable AI as well. Now, covering some of the more um, explainable AI benefits, I would say, um, the first one being the more visibility we have over the machine learning framework, right? It reduces the chances of error, uh, which has the potential to cost any company like thousands of dollars. Uh, and don't get me wrong here, right? Errors are not just like wrong algorithm. It could, it could look like a loss, which can be costly. Um, model bias is another prevalent issue these days in some of the open machine learning technologies. And bias might also creep in if you're building something in house, right? So XAI allows you to capture it before your model is deployed and then eventually act on it. Um, just so that I can even clarify what bias means, a very popular example is a recent case that happened with one of the companies uh, where a husband and wife had the same income and assets, but husband received a higher limit on the credit card and it eventually ended up with a lawsuit against the company because they were biased and the model was biased because just because she was a female, she didn't receive uh, equal treatment. And this could have been avoided, right? Again, if you would have taken the glass box approach. So coming to the third advantage, a layer of XAI gives you more confidence with your code. Um, you know what's happening and you now have the tools to explain it to your partners or stakeholders. Another one being, it ensures that you're being compliant um, because in some of the regulated industries, you do have to get required approvals from, uh, from a few committees. Um, so explainable AI gives you the framework, the tool set uh, to get proper approvals, cross that hoops before you are deploying your model in production. Um, it also improves the model. And as I mentioned in the introduction, uh, the feedback loop, the feedback that you receive from a business standpoint, from a technical standpoint, it gives you an upper hand um, in front of all the stakeholders, in front of everyone. And since this leads to uh, senior leadership being on board, um, you know, obviously ensures transparency, um, and also they are more keen to opt for the AI route because it's no more a black box for them. They exactly understand what's happening and you have taken the time and um, build those tools so that you can explain them uh, what is going, what is happening behind the scenes. Okay, so now getting to the practical techniques to, to leverage XAI. And the first one that I would like to highlight um, is, you know, fairness and bias data testing. So definitely bias often creeps in the data. And I already uh, shared an example just before how, uh, how we might not even realize that bias can creep in. So it is important to check uh, the fairness and the bias in the data first. 
the basic default that's moving in your AI or machine learning model is your data. So as you do all the other data quality checks, this is another check that can be added uh, to the DQ checks just to ensure that your data is accurate. And there are multiple ways on how you can do it, right? Definitely, uh, this is not a one size fit all approach. You might have a different approach to it, um, but uh, I have highlighted a few. Whenever we begin a data science project, you might be doing some exploratory data analysis. You might be uh, putting some charts or using some dashboards to just play around with your data. And then if you see that there is a huge number of missing values, that could be a red flag. It could mean that we are missing a part of uh, population. So it's always a good to kind of dive deep to see what's happening, right? Um, outliers could be another indication of that. And one of the other data quality checks that you can do is to check for skewness and check how it looks like, and that might be an indication if there are any issues with the data, or it could also indicate that your data is favored towards a certain population, um, and that could lead to a bias model. So on your right, I have uh, listed a few open source technologies. Uh, okay, I hope everyone can see the open source technologies. Um, so some of the open source technologies that I've highlighted here, which can also help you for the XAI. Um, the first one being the What of Tool uh, by Google, right? It's an, again an interactive tool to understand the data. It gives you um, an interface of a dashboard, so basically you can play around with your data, check the working behind the machine learning model, especially wherever you're leveraging TensorFlow. Then there is deep left or deep learning important feature. It is again another method for uh, decomposing the output prediction of a neural network. And it basically compares the activation of each neuron to its reference activation. And then it assigns the contribution scores. Um, and then Skater is another open source Python library which can again help with uh, the interpretation of the border. We also have AIX360, uh, which can help you comprehend, again, how machine learning models predict labels um, throughout the life cycle. And uh, in the end of the yes? Pardon me. So I'm getting a slight echo. Could uh, you bar? Okay. Yeah, so could you speak closer to the microphone? Oh, I sure. think that would help out. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Thank you. Yeah, please feel free to stop if you <laughs> feel that, you know, it, it's not clear enough. Is it clear now? Yes, thank you, Supreet. Okay, awesome, awesome. Um, so, yeah, as I was saying that at the end of the presentation, I have a few references where you can go and explore these tools um, because, you know, as you might be working on some data, your industry might be different. Um, so you'll be able to appreciate one tool over the other. So definitely go check them out. Okay, so the other technique, which is one of the most popular techniques um, is a line. Um, so it's called local interpretable model agnostic explanations. Um, so what it does in a nutshell is um, that it gives you a framework so that for your complex model, um, basically it can provide you an explanation that looks like a linear model or a decision tree. Um, so something very simple, right? That can be easy to understand and then easy to present uh, to, to all the non-technical audience. And the models are trained on a small sample of the original data and they basically provide local approximations. So I, just to kind of dive deep into this, um, I found this example online, which I feel kind of captures the sentiment of Lime and how it would look like. So um, there are basically four steps to Lime, right? So first you start with a normal image, right? And then you use the black box model, which could be a CNN or any advanced neural net model uh, to produce a probability distribution over the classes, right? And then uh, you alter the input in some way. So by altering, I basically mean that for images, this could be uh, hiding the pixels by coloring them gray, 
And now you run through the black box model to see the, how the probability um, has changed. Probability, and you're doing the comparison from the originally predicted uh, probability. Then the third step is basically you use an interpretable model, usually like a linear model, it could be a decision tree um, on this altered data set to extract the key features which will explain the changes or the key factors which actually contributed for your model to be in this way. And then the model is locally varied, meaning that we care more about the alterations that are more like the original images uh, that we were using. So then the last step is basically you output the features uh, with, with the greatest weights, and that is kind of you know, your explanation for uh, your CNN model. So this is just a very small example. Again, line can be used in so many multiple, uh, so many ways, uh, but this is just a general framework that can be used uh, from a technical standpoint. Okay, so the next is principle of XAI. So now, um, you attended my presentation and hopefully you'll go and read more about explainable AI. And now you might have two emotions here, right? One, it might seem daunting on how and where to start. And on the other hand, it might sound appealing and for social good. So probably a solution for all the challenges you might be facing in your organizations. You're really pumped uh, to, to inculcate these frameworks. Um, but how do you start? Where do you start? What are the principles that so there are some basic principles that you must keep in mind to achieve any of these. And first one is, you know, what XAI can do for you. So but based on your use case, company, team, et cetera, you need to decide why you are choosing XAI, right? And so that that will allow you to choose appropriate frameworks. Um, so the why has to be very clear before starting. Another one is just like any other machine learning model, you need to have appropriate metrics to measure its impact. You need to see um, that your XAI framework is actually working um, as per your desire. And the third one being, you should think not only of the leaders, but also the end users on how are you safeguarding their interests. Um, so think about the users. And then the last and one of the most important principle is once you have your observations from the explainable AI model, how are you preventing uh, this from happening, right? Um, so there comes the concept of responsible AI. And what I mean by prevention is, um, so explainable AI is like a post-mortem report, right? It's an, it's an after effect of a disaster. But responsible AI mechanisms will help you design frameworks that you're not in a situation where explainable AI can output any red flags ever. You're doing the fairness bias testing. Oh, great, fairness bias testing. Your data is fair, you know, good to for the machine learning model. So you need to have those appropriate frameworks uh, beforehand. And that is uh, what is the entire concept developing responsible AI um, machine learning algorithms. Okay, now coming to the next slide, which is the industry use cases. Um, so different industries are definitely exploding with XAI interest, especially the highly regulated industries that have a responsibility to retain and protect highly confidential information of their clients or patients. So naturally, they're leveraging the data to derive insights. They should be able to justify to the user. They should be able to uh, follow all the compliance steps, um, et cetera. So starting with one of the highly regulated industries, again, which is healthcare, where doctors can now leverage AI, especially in the case of rare diseases, to predict mortality, risk to a disease, um, and basically be better planned to handle such uh, future uh, disasters. And so XAI frameworks basically gives doctors and the healthcare industry the tools that in case a patient is not happy with the outcome or they have a questionable outcome, they're able to backtrack it because here we are talking about life and death. Um, so it's really necessary to have those frameworks in place. 
And the second segment is uh, marketing. So uh, personalization, every industry wants to become the Amazon. Hence, it's important to understand why a recommendation was provided to a customer. And if you feel that it was a biased decision or it does not add up based on your business knowledge, you can always um, check the model, check the data, retrain it. Uh, again, the feedback loop mechanism can be deployed here. Insurance is another industry that is leveraging AI to predict claims, but since you're close to consumers, again, you should be able to understand why a customer is a high-risk customer so that you can charge them the premium accordingly, um, so that you can deal with them differently than the low-risk customers. Um, and as you know, for the insurance industry, it's all about the premiums. So if, if the premiums are too high, if they're just giving away the premiums, the company will actually... Um, can can go to a potential loss um, so last but not the least is my current sector which is the financial industry and it is leveraging xai to ensure uh, that no one feels left out and they can cater to everyone in terms of investment solutions or consumer banking engagements uh, by following the path of a fair ai model in addition to all of this this is about the corporate sector but even government is also having keen interest on this want to invest as part of their research. Uh, one of the organizations that I read, um, you know, they're looking to invest in this area is US Department of Health and Human Services, um, SEI, et cetera. So there are many government organizations as well that are uh, planning to deploy these models. Okay, so now talking about the limitations, um, every coin has two sides and explainable AI has its own pitfalls as well. Um, so though we have techniques to avoid bias, I would, I'm jumping to the first limitation here. Sometimes it can be tricky to avoid unconscious bias and you might have to get creative with your existing techniques. Um, so though we have the frameworks, but they're still limited and that, that makes that is my second uh, limitation, right? That it's an evolving field, techniques are limited, and you might not have a suitable framework for your use case in hand or your industry in hand. And um, then OPC XAI has different context in different industries. People often ask me, oh, then what is responsible AI? Oh, then what is explainable AI? So I that's why I kind of clarified it um, two, two or three slides back as to how responsible AI and explainable AI kind of go hand in hand. They are not two different uh, things altogether. And, uh, and the last one is accuracy versus interpretability. And you are trying to do something like this. It's possible uh, that you might have to encounter this trade-off. Now you want to deploy a highly advanced machine learning algorithm, but you don't know what its XAI framework framework would look like. And that, that's a, quite a possible situation um, that I feel data scientists and other practitioners encounter day in and day out. Uh, and this is again, just because it's a limited field, it's evolving. So you have to do the best that you can with whatever you have in hand. So my last slide is um, that if you're thinking to make a career move here, you might think how to choose this what skill set is needed uh, to succeed in this role. You might have got a sense by now, now that it involves quite a bit of stakeholder management and, and hence strong communication uh, skills are required. Uh, you, know, you have to deliver a compelling story of your results, convince senior leadership, convince the management. Um, so that is why having a strong storytelling attribute in yourself or you know you can develop it as well uh, is required now to support your story you also need facts and that is where your knowledge of machine learning life cycle and the understanding of uh, machine learning algorithms will come into play so you'll have more confidence when you're delivering your results because you exactly understand what's going behind you don't have to be like you know an expert expert where you have you have to have a PhD in mathematics maybe to, to understand these machine learning algorithms, but at least knowing the basic functionality of these and be 
have the potential to tie it back to the business problem um, is critical for success. And the last one is, um, you know, leadership skills. So they are a plus in all the professions and uh, leadership skills will obviously uh, be necessary uh, if you want to pivot into this field as well. Okay, and this brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, thank you everyone for being patient listeners. And now I will open the floor to questions, um, comments, um, yeah. And these are all the references that you can uh, maybe read uh, after this presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Supreet. And you have quite a few questions in the Q&A panel. So I can leave it up to you in terms of if we wanted to go sequentially, which I think may be the, the best option right now. And you have plenty of time. So just as a point of reference for timing. So we start the next workshop in about a good 32 minutes from now. So we have okay. questions. And okay. let's start with the first question, if you'd like. Oh. And we can continue from there. I can read it out loud so you can hear it and then reply if that's okay with you. Yeah, of course. That would be great. Thank you. You're welcome. So the first question, I, I have some thoughts about it. So the person did ask, what is a glass box approach? I think they may have heard another term, but that was the first person's question. I will, I will let you interpret question yeah of course of course and i think um i did mention in my introduction and uh, apologies if it was not clear enough um so black box approach definitely is you know where you uh, have built the machine learning model um you have the results but now you're not able to backtrack it uh, because it's too complex for you to understand uh, and you know everyone's questioning you okay what have you done here <laughs> right and then comes the explainable ai framework which basically provides you the glass box approach because now you're exactly able to see through your results you know what has happened you are able to build simple models to justify your results and that's why explainable ai is also sometimes referred to as glass box approach so in simple terms, that's what it is. <laughs> so, you know, that's great. No, it's interesting because I think that a lot of the next questions will follow up with kind of similar themes. Okay. So the next question is, is XAI a concept, a software product, suite of products? Who developed XAI? This is a loaded question. Yeah, for the development, I'm sorry. I am weak in history. <laughs> I don't know who developed it. Uh, you know, definitely I would like to uh, find that out. But if it's a concept, a framework, uh, I would say it's a concept plus a framework. I think it's a combination of both. And actually, you can convert it into a product for your own use case yes. uh, if you were to deploy it. So, yeah. So I think it's a combination of everything. And I think Valerie has, uh, Something to say on this? So, well, one item is no, she's just um, pointing out oh. that we're answering the question live. And oh, okay, 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 yeah, just it. so they know that the answers are, you know, being given to them right now at this time. Okay. I do, I do have a comment. So as a part of my own work and a part of my own research with explainable AI, it's been a concept that's been around historically for quite some time, but right. it's finally gained traction over the past few years. But conceptually, there's a lot of additional work being done in around the 1970s, but there's been an explosion for a variety of reasons over the past few years. So yeah. we've, we've definitely seen an uptick and it's a current active area of research. Correct, correct. Well, thank you so much for that. <laughs> And here is our next question. So, ooh, this is interesting, Lime. So on the alteration of data for Lime, what do we need to do to it? What are the typical alterations that should be done? Yeah, again, so this is um, kind of going to depend on what your data looks like. Like the example that I took, it was an image data, right? So you are basically now uh, changing your pixels because that's kind of your input data. 
Now, if your data was um, probably a heavy loaded non-linear data set, and now you want to make a linear model out of it. So basically you have to tweak the data based on the requirements so that you can even be able to produce a linear model and the decision tree. And that actually brings me to another point, and that is why data science practitioners or machine learning engineers are hesitant to adopt this because somewhere you lose the beauty of the data and its complexities in order to fit into an explainable AI framework. Um, and that's why the hesitance, and that's that's a limitation, I would say. Absolutely. Um, and just to add to that, you know, for a lot of machine learning applications, there's some form of pre-processing of the data that's going to be involved because most of the data is not clean when we yeah. first to use it. Exactly, exactly. Okay, now speaking of signals, here's the next question. How good is XAI with neural signals? Any comments on it? Um, I personally haven't encountered a use case for that, so I don't know if I can comment on it, um, but definitely, um, you know, for me, my, my work or my kind of research has been on the other side, um, but yeah, so I think that is something that I haven't explored yet yet <laughs> so, yeah and that makes sense and you have the next question which i think has a connection to this current question so can you speak to the specifics of the xai framework yeah i mean um some of the specifics i think that i already kind of touched upon um in my presentation uh, right like the, the fairness bias testing and the line and decision trees and linear models. I think those are all kind of framework. And I also touched upon some of the open source technologies, which I feel can also be used like a framework for your own uh, use case. Um, but is there any other specific framework that you would like me to uh, comment on, please, you know, feel free to put it on the chat uh, or sorry, Q, Q and a panel. I think that if the person does want to know more, they will comment, but for now, that was great. And we have a following question. So this is timely. There's been news recently of researchers in many different fields having to retract their papers due to improperly applied or built machine learning models. Can XAI help verify the build and application of machine learning models? And the person sent the link to the article. So any thoughts about that particular topic? Yeah, I think this is such a great article and, you know, obviously such a great uh, news, I would say, where we can again appreciate the beauty of XAI. Uh, I don't know because I don't know what exactly the research was as to, you know, if it could have 100% be able to verify the build and the application for model, but definitely deploying an XAI model would have given more confidence to researchers uh, to justify um, his research. And that is where, again, XAI comes into play. Um, so yeah, definitely I feel there's a role uh, of that, but I can question, I can comment more once I read what the exact research was, so yeah. Absolutely, and here's a question related to a comment that you'd made earlier. So where do you recommend learning to use XAI for our career paths? Yeah, again, that's a great question. I think some of the resources that I attached in the end would give you a brief as to what the XAI uh, looked like. Um, Sadly, uh, I have been exploring some of the courses and resources. There are no like courses, courses the way you'll have for data science, though there is interest. So people are trying to build those explainable AI and responsible AI boot camps um, to assist people like us who might want to pivot in this field. Uh, but still the research and resources are limited. So you might have to rely more on medium towards data science, such articles or attend such presentations. <laughs> Those are all great resources. Thank you, Supreme, <laughs> all of them. And here's the next question. So how can you test for biases within AI programming, which you may have touched on a little bit earlier, but. Yes, um, yes. Yeah. yeah, I can kind of reiterate to that as well. Um, so as I also mentioned, right, bias is not in the model. Uh, bias in, is in your data. And it creeps 
in the model um, because your data was biased. And that is why the technique that I provided, the fairness and bias testing, I cannot stress it enough on how important it can be when you're trying to build your machine learning model. Um, so yeah, definitely leverage that. Okay. And then the next question is specific to a particular tool. So are there XAI methodologies available in Python? Yes, all the open source technologies that I just touched upon are available for you to uh, call it in your Python or you know, PySpark or whatever you might be using. Um, the other models, even if you want to build line models, uh, for that, if you have a decision tree or linear uh, models, you can easily build it from scikit-learn. So ample technology is available in Python for this. Okay, and this is great. This is helpful. And there's a next question. Could you please explain how does Lime work once more? Um, sorry, sorry, what? Can you repeat? The, the question is, can you please explain how does Lime work? So the okay. person realizes you explained it again, but they're asking, could you explain it again? <laughs> okay. okay, yeah, of course. Um, so in a nutshell, um, let me take another example, right? So if you know a working of a decision tree, or if you know a working of a linear model. So what we're basically trying to do is that even if your data is very complex, right? It could be pixels or it could be like a non-linear dirty data. What we're essentially trying to do is you're trying to fit it in a simple model uh, like a decision tree or a linear regression or a logistic regression. And I keep iterating these because these are like the most widely used models for explainable AI, right? So that is why when I say you build local approximations of your data, that is what you're trying to do. You're trying to take a piece of your data, which you feel is like a representation of your larger data set, and then building these small models so that you're able to justify the functioning of your complex model. But there's another great resource um, that I've attached, which is a Towards Data Science article. And there they also have good examples for in Python on how line makes sense. Uh, so feel free to check that out. And if you have any additional questions, reach out to me for sure. Absolutely. And, you know, just as a side note, we will be providing information so you can connect with Supreet. So keep that in mind as well to reach out to Supreet after. And we have a next question. This is the work I want to do. I already have an advanced degree in social science research and I'm getting started with an R certification course. What would you recommend for getting the skills ready to join the field? Yeah, some of the skills that I also mentioned, uh, which is the last slide that you might need, um, but since your background is definitely unique, I would say let's connect offline and then we can talk about you know, how uh, you can pivot in this field. Uh, but our programming is great. So we need some programming tools to um, succeed in this field. Uh, but at the same time, as I said, basic knowledge of machine learning algorithms are also necessary um, for you to succeed here. Absolutely. And, you know, and keep in mind with a lot of the skills that are being developed, there's a lot of overlap between many of the fields that a number of people here may be representing. So this is great. And the next question I see is as follows. So are there any live projects or a small demo if possible where you might have used XAI? So maybe um, another example. Yeah, I think some of, um, I mean, some of the work that I've done in the past is something that was highly compliant and I, I can, cannot share all of that. But there are some good open source notebooks and everything. So if you follow my data bus page as well on LinkedIn, I do share some good resources on all the AI trends, right? Even on explainable AI and other AI trends as well. So I do keep sharing resources, but if I find something, I'll definitely share it there as well, uh, which I feel is very compelling and close to the work that we do in the corporate world. Absolutely. And one of the other items is as follows. So I'm going to skip to a particular question. Would you say bias in machine learning stems from relaxing the rigor of statistical analysis that starts from data collection to analysis? Wow, but that's a great point. Um, and I feel, yes, somewhere that is true. 
And as I said, there is some unconscious bias that we all have, right? Like as humans as well. And from where is this data coming? This data is coming from us, users, consumers. Um, so yes, there is an inherent bias everywhere uh, from data collection piece to, to data delivery, to data wrangling and everywhere. Um, so yeah, it, it does have a big part to play. Absolutely. And we have a, another question fairly similar to a question you had a few minutes ago. So the person highlights, I have two of the skill sets to succeed. Are there educational, free and or paid resources that you recommend to continue to learn and upskill? Okay, so I'm assuming that the two of the skill set you, that you're mentioning might be the machine learning skill set. <laughs> I don't that, know. That's <laughs> what I believe. I haven't seen it in the question itself, but we can, I guess, maybe have that assumption. Yes, yes. So again, going back to my previous answer, as I mentioned, there are some great articles out there, some of the references that I've mentioned, some of the papers that I've mentioned. Um, and I'll also keep sharing some great resources as the research evolves, as people you know, write about all of this, um, there's going to be ample um, so be patient with me, be, be there with me on my LinkedIn and, you know, I'll do, sh I'll share whatever I find useful. Perfect. Excellent. And it seems as if, you know, for a lot of those types of questions, there's probably going to be some additional conversation. So we'll, you know, try to figure that in there if those questions come up again. And here's another question. Some of the XAI principles remind me of data equity principles in, say, evaluation research. Is there an explicit report on XAI and equity? Hmm. There could be. I can do some more research, not something that I have on top of my mind. Uh, but I, I do feel, and now to your point, I do see some sort of connection. And thank you for that. So I'm, I'm sure that there are some reports or researchers available on that topic. Yeah. Yes. And uh, just to add a note or two about this particular topic. So there is most definitely a connection between explainable AI and equity because mm -hmm. a lot of times explainable AI may be used to try to ensure that there's equity involved with a particular system, whether it's implemented using traditional machine learning techniques and or deep learning. So yeah. there's most definitely that connection. And there have been some papers released fairly recently regarding these themes. Now, is there an explicit report on the two? I'm not aware of that myself, but there are a lot of papers that have been, let's say fairly recently released that kind of highlight those themes. So yeah, yeah. I would be surprised if, you know, there's there's some repository of resources that yeah. could be pointed to. Yeah, yeah. And that brings us to a next question. So would you say that data collected from automated systems like weather data could be called relatively unbiased, no human intervention slash influence. <laughs> I um, have thoughts on this, but please, Supreme. Um, no, I mean, I think I have only one comment. It's, um, I think again, it depends. <laughs> you know, it, it, it depends, uh, definitely. And I, I wouldn't kind of have, make a strong statement saying, oh, there's no bias or no some, you know, because bias can be, so many types of bias. This is one bias that I touched upon in my presentation. Uh, so I wouldn't completely get it off the plate. I would still have, you know, that bias kind of thing in your mind when you're trying to process the data. Um, yeah, so I wouldn't make that assumption <laughs> just yet. That's great. That's a wonderful answer. And you're absolutely right. There's so many different types of bias. And we can't totally say that with this particular type of data that there's there isn't something there, whether it's how a particular device or sensor is calibrated or something else. Yeah, so great answer, great answer. And we have a few more questions. So can you speak to the balance between accuracy and explainability in the machine learning models? Have you had to step down to a less accurate model to provide a better explanation to a client? <laughs> yes. So as I said, in a highly regulated industry, you often uh, encounter that trade-off. You might, unless you're able to justify your model, it might not be able to cross those regulatory hoops, right? Uh, and it's not just, um, you know, my company or any company, it's just a general industry trend that you have to cross those hoops to be able to leverage AI. And 
data science practitioners, uh, I talk to some of them in conferences and they often are at this crossroads and they might have to opt for it because, you know, consumer satisfaction, consumer happiness is like the prime, <laughs> doesn't matter. So yes, you might have to, yep. That makes sense. And we have a, a question that's asking us to repeat an item we may have highlighted earlier. Could you repeat what makes what makes XAI better than AI? Um, I wouldn't say like XAI is better than AI. I would say XAI is another layer on top of your AI model to make it more integratable and adoptable uh, to, to the other non-technical folks and your consumers. I'm touching upon, again, other benefits that I mentioned in my presentation. Um, so it's not XAI versus AI, it's XAI and AI to build successful models. That's great. And I just want to acknowledge, I do see the comments related to the weather data not being biased. Yeah. Or it's not unbiased. So yes, I agree with the comments that are there. I just wanted to acknowledge them. I'm not gonna read all of them, but I acknowledge them. And here's a next question. So. Is there any fundamental difference between responsible AI and the explainable AI framework? Yeah, so um, again, as I said, they are kind of, I would say they are two peas in a pod, and at least that's my understanding. People might differ. Um, and as that example that I was stating, right, explainable AI is like a post-mortem report. Your disaster happened, and now explainable AI is telling you this is wrong, that was wrong. And responsible AI is like, oh, you're starting your model because you have all of these frameworks deployed. You are doing everything um, in your truest sense that I have to deploy a fair model, an explainable model, right? And that is kind of, responsible AI is more of like a culture that you cultivate in your organization or in your team uh, to build those, <laughs> right? <laughs> and explainable AI frameworks will just help you cultivate that culture. Um, yeah, but that's like, again, my true essence, I might be wrong. <laughs> and I just want to say to your point, though, I have seen some people describe responsible AI as being proactive versus explainable AI being reactive. Exactly. So it's, it's where I could definitely see your point. So it, it makes a lot of sense. And we have a, another question. So does XAI face the messaging or perception that it may be, and this is in quotes, lower form of communicating complex machine learning slash AI information. Yeah, definitely. Again, I think that is again one of the limitations or one of the inhibitions that practitioners have while adopting this because they feel that we are dumbing down things. We are using these complex models and you know then we are building these frameworks and we're dumbing down. But again, you need to look at the greater good. Right, like what are you trying to achieve? What is your goal? And that's why I said before deploying any XAI framework, ask the question, why? Why are you doing this? And that will just help you in your journey to achieve it. And you would never go back because you know exactly you know, the why behind the reasoning. So yeah, I, I would uh, second to that uh, sentiment. And we have another question. Okay, the person says, pardon if this was answered, but you know, here's the question. At which stage in the machine learning life cycle would you employ the XAI framework? Again, another great question. Um, so I feel in the multiple stages, right? It's not that, you know, you, you started from the very start, like, as I said, the fairness bias testing. And that's why I chose two of the techniques to be discussed because one is used just once you have the data, which is the fairness bias testing. And when you're spending some time with your data to understand, right, is there any bias? Is my data fair? And then once you have built your model, you're actually building an explainable AI model along with that. And then before you are deploying it to production, you are again seeking feedback from your stakeholders. And uh, again, deploying you know, the feedback loop from your model. Now feedback loop can also look different, right? Sometimes it can just be uh, doing a small testing on a sample and seeing you know, how the model looks like. Sometimes it can just be seeking directly the feedback of your subject matter experts. So at various steps, you're just being very conscious of what you're deploying. Um, so yeah, that, that, I, I feel like that covers the question. I think so, I, I definitely think so. And just being mindful of time. So yep, we have eight minutes left. Here's this next question. So the next question is, 
how did models that are supposedly created in open source frameworks and concepts become known as a black box? Since XAI is using glass box models, why are we using the imagery of boxes? Um, so again, right, even if you are uh, creating an open source framework and creating the model, so XA is basically helping you explain the output, not the build. No one's interested in that. Uh, if you see like the senior leaders and everyone, your data scientists, your machine learning practice, definitely they are interested in the math behind the algorithm and all of that fancy terms. At the end of the day, business stakeholders think differently. They're like, how much profit is this bringing? What is this actually doing? So that is where XAI comes into play. So even if you might be using your open source frameworks, and I don't say that XAI is used should be used for everything. If you're building a simple decision tree model and you're taking time to explain it to your stakeholders, um, you have done your due diligence there. But if you are building a highly complicated neural network model, that is where your frameworks need to come into play. So again, use case to use case, it will depend on what's needed. And the second part of the question is, since XA is using glass box model, why are we using the imagery of boxes? I am not sure what that means. <laughs> Yeah, it's an interesting second part for the person who posted that question. Maybe uh, elaborate in the Q and A panel. Yeah, the part of the Thank question. You. Yeah, and it's one of those items where, so to your point about you know XAI in general, there's some thinking that exists that XAI is typically connected to you know people who are using deep learning, who are creating neural yeah. networks, yeah. versus people who are using more traditional machine learning models, such as your decision trees and otherwise. But, right. you know, do you think that that type of thinking is already showing some bias where people shouldn't and think along that pathway? Exactly. Yeah, that's what I said. That even if you're building a simple decision tree model, right? Like at the back of your mind, you should be doing your due diligence. You should be ensuring that you are doing everything in the right way and you're conscious of what you're building. And you know that's another XAI <laughs> framework, I would say. You're already being so responsible with your AI model, so yeah. Absolutely. And I'm just checking out to make sure that we have addressed the questions that we have in the Q&A panel. So it looks as if people are asking for reference items. So just to point out overall, after yeah. this particular presentation, Supreet has kindly provided us with links to her presentation. And also all these workshops are being recorded and they will be available after we finish the WIDS workshops for today. But Supreet has kindly provided us with information related to her presentation and also other resource links that we can share as well. So thank you. And hopefully yeah. that addresses those, that family of questions. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. Um, and I, yeah, please uh, do reach out to me on LinkedIn if your question was not answered. And, you know, if you have anything else, any comments, any good resources, be free to share. Um, so. Absolutely. And we've got at least another. So, yes. So, just to answer this question quickly. Yes. So, we will share Supreet's LinkedIn profile. So, we will do that. And here is uh, another question, and this will probably be our last question. And here we are. So what are your views on engaging and educating young people, for example, high school age students on the career possibilities available in the data science and machine learning world? It seems like there is more we could do to communicate the value in studying math and science in this age group. In turn, this could improve diversity and inclusion in STEM subjects and therefore representation in the future workforce and AI having a positive impact in the quality and ethics of AI. Is this something Data Buzz does or would consider? Yeah, that, that's a great point, right? And there are organizations that will see data ethics for all. Um, and there are these ethnic schools that have already started and they start at a very uh, young age. They have already started training high school students. And uh, I know so many people that I meet in the conferences who are founders of these um, NGOs and companies and they are doing some amazing work. So I think there are already organizations out there that are starting. And they're not only training people on AI level, they're training them responsibly AI level so that they are already conscious of what they're building. Um, so there is some great work. Again, um, I think it's 
Catherine, uh, feel free to reach out to me. And if you are interested, I can actually connect you to those people who are doing that work. <clears throat> uh, you know, so I'd be happy to do that. Great. And we're about to switch over to the next workshop, but time for one more question. And here it is. So what would you suggest to the people who want to start <laughs> data science? Wow. Or study data science? Yes, I mean, um, definitely, I feel like if you see my LinkedIn, I had a very unique background where I came from a non-technical background, pivoted into data science um, from my master's and then started doing internships and other jobs to pivot into this field. But one thing I would like to say is data science comes in all shapes and forms. It's not just about building models. It's about data strategy. It's about explainable AI. There's so many facets of data science. So please just don't get lost in one of them. If you're not able to get to, you might not even know that you might have your skill set and interest in some of the other facets. So do explore that. Talk to people. That is where you'll be able to know where you want to land. And with that in mind, thank you very much, Supreet, for mm -hmm your workshop, as well as for all of your answers to the questions. Thank you so much. Yes, of course. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.